Welcome to Accelerate Church's television broadcast. My name is Garrett Griffin, and this is my wife, Farrell. We're associate ministers here at Accelerate Church. And we're thrilled you're joining us. We invite you to get your expectations up, get your hopes up, and get ready for God's Word that will come forth from Pastor Jeremy. It's going to be a great message. Get your Bible out, and let's jump in. Just to the degree that you believe Him will be to the degree that you will be established. And remember, established means to be built up, to be supported, to be firm, to be faithful, permanent, and certain. I like that, certain. There's nothing unsure or uncertain about the legit Christian life. If you want to know why so many people that claim the name of Christ struggle and don't live a legit Christian life, it's because they're not established. Why are they not established? Because they don't truly believe in the Lord your God. Now, you've got to realize this. When you read the word believe in the Lord your God, that doesn't mean that you are like a demon level who believe he exists. You know, someone said, well, I don't even believe there is a God. Well, that's what a fool says in his heart. So it comes out of his mouth. There is no God. That's foolishness. That's, that's, there's not even words to describe that. So someone asked me, well, how do you witness to someone who is like that and doesn't even believe there is a God? And here's what I say. The law of God. What? Yeah. You ask them, have they ever stolen anything? Have they ever told a lie? Yeah, have they used God's name? You've heard me go through this before, haven't you? Use God's name as a curse word, lust after someone. And you know what they're going to tell you? Wow, yeah, I have. And you know what? Even though in their mind they're trying to say, oh, I don't believe in a God. Guess what? It, the law of God is written on the inside of them. Now they have to start arguing with themselves. That sure enough beats trying to have some kind of philosophical argument with somebody's mindset. I've seen a lot of that. I've tried that. And I don't believe that's the most effective way to witness and to leave an imprint on someone. I believe that when you use the law of God, it's for everyone. You know, Paul told Timothy that and said the law is good. So there goes the whole idea you say it's bad. It's good, but it's for the sinner. It's for the homosexual. It's for the lawless. As someone asked me that one time, how do you witness to a homosexual? I use the law of God. It's the same for everyone. Well, how do you witness to a Muslim or a Buddhist? Same exact way. Why? Because you start realizing something. God's law makes judgment make sense. If I just tell someone judgment's coming, they might not understand why. What does that even mean? I found this out. If I just go tell people, I've got good news. Jesus died for you and he rose again so that you don't have to die a sinner. There may be somebody that needs to hear that. You have no idea someone's past. But let me just tell you this. I found that most people I talked to that were strangers had no use for the good news. What bothered me is it wasn't good news to them. They weren't moved by it. Some would even say, yeah, I know that. I thought, man, you're talking about the greatest news that there's ever been. You don't have to spend eternity in hell, eternity bound up in sin, Dictated to by the flesh, you can be free. And someone says, yeah, well, I already know. I don't care. I mean, right to my face they told me that. And so I realized i gotta, I got to rethink my approach when I'm trying to be a witness here. Amen. Now, you need to be prayed up in the Holy Spirit because you never know where someone is. And there might be someone you come across that needs to hear, Jesus loves you. Right? So you don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, I'm never going to witness that way. But let me tell you one sure way that you can get the cross to people. You can ask them, hey, have you ever heard about the good news, t- uh, the good person test? Not the good news, the good person test. And they'll say, oh, no. And there you go. They got their guard down right off the bat. Now, once they figure out what you're doing, some people will shun you. Just rejoice. Be excited that you at least got to bring up eternity and got to bring up the law of God as much as you do. Amen? That was for free. The reason I'm saying this is because you're going to come across people that say, well, I believe, but they're not established. So being established is fruit that you truly believe. See, it's one thing to say you believe. It's another thing to live the established lifestyle. Yeah, what am I talking about? The faithful lifestyle. See, one way you can gauge it, is it a chore to get to church? You see what I'm saying? Is it, does it weight you down? Because if you believe in the Lord, you believe He's the one that placed the demand to assemble more and more. It wasn't Pastor Jeremy. Do not compliment me that well, please. 
I did not come up with that idea. But remember, also, in this ministry, we're connected to the prophet, Dr. Mark Barclay, who said, I'll remind you, one of the most effective things you can do as an end-time Christian is be at church every time the doors are open. That's exactly what you could do. So then guess what the enemy's going to do? Fight you to do that exact thing. And make you think, well, it's just church. I need to stay home. There's no refreshing like getting in the Word. Amen. Praise the Lord. See, you don't get more established by worshiping at St. Mattress. That doesn't allow you to live the established Christian life. You need to sleep. He gives his beloved sleep. There's a time for that. And it's not church time. And I'm just going to tell you, if you would stop cutting out on God and really believe in him, he would establish you. He would establish you. Believe in the Lord your God, you'll be established. Believe as prophets, and you shall prosper. Praise God. This very verse is written, and right after this, you can see that great victory was achieved by the entire nation of Israel because they did what this verse said. They put the song leaders in front of the warriors. It said, lead us in some songs. They started praising God. And when you start praising God, it has the same effect that this had on that day. It steals the enemy. <laughs> yeah, he made their steps solid. He wants to make your steps solid. The established life is what, here's what it is, step after step that's solid. Day after day that's solid. You're not up one day, down the next. Up one day, down. Jerk it around by the chain of circumstance all your life. Oh, no. Oh, my. See, no matter what's going on, you should still be established in the things of God. Somebody say amen. amen. And when we ended Sunday, we looked at this, that the Lord wants us walking on straight paths, not crooked. God's never designed for you to say, well, i got to go out here and live in the world, try to navigate and be real out here with the world. There's a lot of people whose souls have been snatched from them, and they're in hell right this moment because they tried to go out here and navigate and think that they could do this without walking on a straight path. You can't walk crooked with the world and get them on a straight path. You have to understand the straight path and be walking on it and say, come on, let's go. I'll take you by the hand, and let's get on the straight path. But if you're still a crooked walker yourself, then guess what? There's no way you can lead them to freedom. Jesus described it as the blind leading the blind. What happens? You lead them to the ditch. That's where disaster happens. Hebrews 12, 13 says, make straight paths for your feet. So notice this. The responsibility is ours. Well, if God wanted me to walk on a straight path, he would make it straight. He said, quote, Make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So here's where we left off. We, as children of God, have to remove every obstacle out of the way so that we don't stumble and fall all the time. Hello, my name is Erin File, and I'm the pastor's wife here at Accelerate Church, and I want to invite you to come, come to Accelerate, come, come meet me. I would love to shake your hand and welcome you because I want you to know God has a plan for you. God has a good life plan for you, but right now you've got to get to a place where you can shake off the dark thing, shake off the confusion, shake off the things that are trying to hold you back from what he's called you to do. And what he's called you to do is a good life. I'm gonna remind you in the Bible, it says that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is a hell, and we want to help you escape that place. We want to teach you how to live free from darkness and dark bondage that tries to get on so many people. And your answer is in the Word. Your answer is in the house of God. So come. This is a house of God. Accelerate church and let us help you. We want to see you here. The most established people I know are those that are at church the most. It's really that simple. You can ask these folks that are around here that are pastors. They tell you the exact same thing. The most established Christians are those that it really takes something huge for them to miss. Well, what is that? That's what it looks like when you're, you're removing all obstacles out of the way. Did you know all it takes is being busy in life for you to stumble and fall? Stumble and fall? Because... When you read the parable 
of the sower sowing the word, you find out that those that are caught in the cares of life, the cares of life choke out the word. And there's nothing in that where Jesus taught that in Mark 4, where he said sin. He said the cares of life. So what does that mean? Well, you've got to take care of your flower garden. You've got to mow the grass. You've got to paint the house. You've got upkeep that you've got to do. We've all got these things that we have to do, right? But why is it that so many people choose church time to do that? Well, I'm just busy, busy, busy. Again, you've got to really examine yourself because it's easy to be self-deceived and think, well, I am living the established life just because you see that the Bible says it's out there to be established. But if you stumble and fall, and you're not on a straight path, then I'm talking to you. It's time. Time is short. And I've got an urgency in me. Jesus is coming. We don't have time to play around. You don't have time to be a wobbly need and stumbling around with the, the sins of this world and, and the cares of that are going on in this life. you got to get faithful. you got to get confirmed in who you are in Christ. you got to know that more than you know your next business deal. Come on, somebody. I was reading this, and I thought, wow, if you go back a few verses, verse 1, Hebrews 12, here's what you find. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Notice, there are things that are weights, and there are things that are sins. Some things you lay aside, not because it's sin, just because it's a weight and weighs you down from your walk with God. And some of that's going to come into relationships that you have. Relationships that try to pull you away from being planted. Because those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish, Psalms 92 says. But we, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Did you know you can't really see these witnesses? But in the spirit, there's a great cloud of witnesses. But there are some witnesses that are watching you, and they're sitting right here with you right now. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? What do we got to do? Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance. King James says patience. Consistently. Stay in the same. We got to run the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. The author. I quote this one a lot, but you really look, lay your eyes on it tonight. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It did not say the cross was something that was joyful. It said for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Wow. He despised the shame. Now he's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Somebody say amen. amen. This tells us the only guaranteed way to victory in life. Keep looking to Jesus. Just keep looking to Jesus. Why? If you look around, you're going to get discouraged. And the devil's counting on the fact that he's going to be able to get you discouraged because he's going to get you caught up on things in the natural. Look at the circumstances. Look who the president is. Look who the mayor is. Look at your friends that aren't treating you right. Look at the way the pastor said this. Look at the way this person looked at you. Look at this. Look at the way your boss is treating you. Look, look, look. Pretty soon you get discouraged. What does that have to do with the call Jesus put on your life? You've got to look to Jesus to fulfill the call. And the call that he's called you to is the call of victory, the call of being established. God's called every single one of us to be established in him. So if I'm not looking to him, I might not live the established lifestyle. If my joy is not in him, then guess what? Say it's in my account when everything's going great. Well, then when everything's not going great, and you get down there to zero or below, and you get a bill that's going to take you into the negative, then what? There goes your joy. But if you practice looking at Jesus, every day I'm going to look to him. Every day, Lord, I look to you. Every day I look to your word. Every day I lift up hands that hang down. Every day I practice this. Then guess what's going to happen? And it's a guarantee, victory. You may not know how. And you may not know when, but I can tell you he's going to do it again. He's going to come through and give you the victory. Yes, he is. Now, think of this. If Jesus could find joy while facing the cross, surely we could find a little joy when it's church time. 
Surely we could find just a little bit of joy when we see a command that we haven't been doing. And we say, oh, we better, we better implement this in our life today. You know what most people do, though? When they find out, the Bible says, hey, do not be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence of an intoxicant. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. Continuously being filled with the Spirit. That first part hangs so many people up right now, it's unbelievable in the day we live. Intoxicant, free. Come on, ain't nothing wrong with drinking. See, once that command comes, they lose their joy. But Jesus didn't lose his joy, and he faced the cross, which is much, 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 much more stressful than anything you've ever faced. He had never done anything to displease his father. He had never sinned one time he was virgin born. And yet he was going to take this punishment, not only a physical beating, but a separation from his father. And he found joy in the middle of that. And we're struggling when the Bible says, come out from the world and be separate. But all the world loves me out here. The church, they don't treat me right, but the worldly people, they love me. Wow. This is how Christians talk. But they're not the established ones. The established ones say, whoa, 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 whoa. If Jesus could find joy when facing the cross, praise God, I thank you. I'm going to be joyful when it's time for me to press in and worship the Lord. I'm not going to be depressed when it's time for prayer. I'm going to be excited. I'm not going to be down and out when i got to obey. I'm going to have a skip in my step. I'm tired of the down and out life. Most Christians do not relate to an established lifestyle. Just imagine if I'd eaten me some hot sauce today, how fired up I'd be tonight. Maybe after church. Isn't this funny? Jesus, it says this. I want you to look at it, Hebrews 12 too. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He's facing the cross, and he found a reason to be joyful. Whew, wow, what is our excuse? You're not facing separation from God. You're not facing a beating so severe that you don't look human. You're not facing that. What are you facing? Oh, I've got to obey? I've got to drag myself up out of bed and show up with a smile on my face? I don't think I can do that. Well, no wonder you're not established. You've got to find joy when you find the commands. Instead of commands equaling depression and heaviness, This is the love of God that you keep His commandments and it's not grievous or burdensome. Pastor Jeremy Fowl here from Accelerate Church in Amarillo, Texas, inviting you to watch our weekly television broadcast right here on this channel. Accelerate Church is in Amarillo and we offer services on Sunday, 10 a.m. and Wednesday, 7 p.m. We'd love to have you. If you can't be here in person, you ought to stream online at acceleratechurch.cc. That's our website. You can find all our information there. We offer weekly children's ministry, high school age ministry, college age ministry, and more at Accelerate Church. You've got to remove every disobedient obstacle that's hindering your walk with God. You have to. God's not going to do it for you. He'll help you. He'll give you grace to do it. But He's not going to remove it. You've got to remove it. You've got to remove it. If it's an obstacle in your way, you move it. You move it. You don't sit on the sideline, put your thumb in your mouth and cry. I guess, I guess God wanted this, me to face this mountain. Modern Christianity, you listen to a song I like to pick on a lot, yes. But, well, if you don't move the mountain, I'll trust you anyway. Have you ever thought about speaking to it in faith? But see, faith has to do with what God said. And you already know that any mountain that's in your way of walking with God is not of God. But you're the one that's responsible to speak and move it. Hallelujah. Stop making life harder than it has to be. That's amazing when I say that. It makes me think of the psalmist. He wasn't even born again, and he got this. In Psalm 37, say, thank God for the Word. word. Psalm 37. Are you excited tonight? Verse 27, it says, depart from evil. Man, this is Old Testament. We're set up now. We are blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled, water-baptized. We've got a Bible. You think you can depart depart from evil? They could back then. Now it's like it's all set up for us. I don't know. 
What do you mean you don't know? you got to depart from it and do good. I want you to look at this. And dwell forevermore. This is out of King James, but when you see forever and forevermore, you could substitute the, the word established there. So here's what you do. Depart from evil, do good, and you will be established. Praise God. Verse 28, for the Lord loves judgment. How do you feel about it? See, a lot of people don't know their Bible. They quote Jesus, misquote him, actually. Talking about with what measure you use, it's going to be brought. And they say, well, I can't judge nothing. Well, that's funny. If you're walking with God who loves judgment, and you, you, I can't judge anything, I'm not sure you're really walking with God. Because, see, when you walk with God, you believe his word. If you want to be established, the Lord loves judgment. And look at this. He forsakes not his saints. Glory to God. They are preserved forever. There's that word forever. It's King James put it in two words, but it's really established. What? The Lord loves judgment. He forsakes not his saints. They are preserved and they're established. Praise God. Do you receive that? Then say amen. amen. It says, but the seed of the wicked will be cut off. Chopped. Look at the next verse, 29, Psalm 37. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein how long? Woo, that's the established life. <laughs> if you live righteous, God's going to establish you. People say, well, I'm righteous. Well, then why does cursing come out of your mouth? You know, there was a testimony the other night. Now, there people, of course, like to criticize. You can't make some people happy no matter what. I found that out. If you're going to lead anyone, you just need to know that. But I found this out, that we have a Christian school that have Christians that play sports. And so we played at another school, and this school said, let's do prayer. They gathered around, they did prayer, and they said amen, and they got done. And the girl leading the prayer came over and said to the coaching staff, hey, y'all, F word, win state, right after she prayed. And then she said, oh, I forgot, y'all don't curse at that school. Well, that's one of the best compliments we've gotten in a while. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Somebody said, well, I don't like it. Well... (laughs) Praise the Lord, we don't put up with that. And see, that gets out, that gets known. For someone that normally does that, and so what is that? It's not shame on that young lady that said that. Here's what I'm trying to point out. That's the average American Christian right there. That's the average American Christian. It's the, it's the unestablished way of living. See, if you want to live life and you want to see good days, refrain your tongue from evil and your lips that they speak no guile. That's the established way of living. That's scripture, by the way. Well, how are you talking? It matters. It says in verse 30, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. His tongue talks of, of what? I don't like that scripture. Most Christians don't because it goes completely anti how most righteous people talk. They say, well, I don't believe in all that. We don't need to be saying that. Yeah, but you'll go, you know, get a pair and you'll say how horrible it was. In fact, let me just say this. You'll go to the store and you can tell just by looking, right? But my wife picked out, well, she ordered some pairs. She gets them delivered. She goes, picks up the pickup, grocery pickup. It's kind of nice. Well, they brought some pairs. And so tonight before church, you know, my sons are always hungry. They've reached that age. They're always hungry. Of course, my two-year-old's always hungry. He won't even get his eyes open. He's like, snack, snack. (laughs) Hey, four or something in the morning last night, he sat down in the hallway, my daddy, my daddy. So I go out there and go get him. I pick him up. He don't even have his eyes open. He's all, snack. I said, it ain't snack time, son. We're going back to bed. Let's go. (laughs) He got snack on his mind. In fact, I guarantee you right now, if he was to hear this, he'd be like, snack? He'd get some brightness in his eye. He likes the snacks. But my son, I'm getting ready for church, you know. I'm like in there, serious business. That's where I realized how windy it was. Fixing my hair. In there, making sure everything looked all right. Trimming some, some whiskers and stuff. And now all of a sudden I hear him say, Dad, Dad. So I go, what, what is it, son? Come out and we have a little landing and it's upstairs and I can look down. So he's holding up a pair. He's like, this pair is horrible. 
I did not shame him for being judgmental because he understands that fruit is not right. I said, well, you wasted it. You're supposed to let it ripen a few more days, throw it out. As hard as that tile, you know. <laughs> well, don't eat it. But you should have judged that thing before you took a bite. Right? Should have felt to that sucker. But either way, he wasn't afraid to tell me, Dad, this pear's bad. I didn't shame him. Did you know God's not going to shame you when you can say, well, that fruit's bad? Especially in light of this, Jesus says, you're going to know false brethren and false prophets, not by what they say, but by their fruit. So if you say, Lord, this is bad fruit, what do I do with this? He'll help you out. He's not going to shame you. you got to be a fruit inspector. You don't ever, you're not able to judge people's motives because you don't always know people's motives. God does. But this kind of judgment is a righteous judgment. The kind of tongue that you ought to have as a righteous person is you're saying, you know what? God is going to make things right. That's what judgment's all about. How many times have you heard of someone that was murdered by someone? And then, I mean, you can watch those 48 hours or whatever those programs are. And you see the family there at the trial. And when they pass the sentence of life in prison or the death penalty, they rejoice or they cry. They're like, justice is served. Right? And everyone understands that. Especially righteous people. Now, lawless people, they don't like that. They want there to be no law. But you've got to speak right. I preached all that to get to verse 31. Are you still with me tonight? <laughs> verse 30, the radio audience is like, for one minute. Love you. Go to acceleratechurch.cc to hear the rest of this sermon. Verse 31, Psalm 37. The law of his God is in his heart. Now, I like this last part. None of his steps shall slide. <laughs> Hey, there's no need to slip and slide your way through life any longer. <laughs> All you got to do is take God's word. Get this thing on the inside of your heart. Do what it says to do. Say what it says to do. And guess what? Your days of slipping and sliding are over. Hey there, we're jumping in to the end of the broadcast. We hate that time has run out, and we believe you have been strengthened in faith by God's word that has gone forth. If you want to hear more of this, Visit AccelerateChurch.cc on the Sermons tab. You'll find everything Pastor Jeremy has preached, and it could be just what you're looking for. Again, we are so thrilled that you've joined us today. If you're in the Amarillo area, we'd love to invite you to our services. Wednesday at 7 p.m., Sundays at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. We would love to see you and meet you.